It never ends. It never ends. Okay, there we go. Oh, All right. So, I Tim, I think we're there. Wait, I'm going to change my gallery view. So, Ma, no. Okay. Um, hey, so we are live. Here we go. <laughs> uh, first of all, thanks for joining us. Um, we're having a very special chat with some friends who also happen to be alumni of the David Bowie bands, various bands. Um, so I'd like to start off by thanking Eventide for hosting this inspiring series called Quarantide. It's been one of the few highlights of this very strange season. So really, um, on this chat today, there's, there's no real agenda. We were just kind of chit-chatting back backstage um, in the green room. And, um, and we're just going to talk about you know, what, what we've been doing or what everybody's been doing, how they've been doing, what they would have been doing, what they want to do, and you know, maybe some reminiscences about the old days. So um, I'm going to hand it off to Mike. Garson, and uh, let's see where it goes from there. Okay, so I'm gonna now tell you what I'm pissed off about six years later. You won't believe this one. Donnie will like this more than anybody. I wanted to play on that fucking album, Black Star, and I heard just what I put on the piano and Lazarus and Black Star. And because I was in LA, David was too cheap to fly me out. He wanted everybody from New York. So go figure. So I sit in my house when no one's around and I add piano to your beautiful arrangements and great keyboard work that's on there. It's it's just, it's, it's, it's like one of these things, a missed opportunity. And yet it took me a year to hear that album because I couldn't, I couldn't confront it. It was so painful. But um, it's a phenomenal album, and it's just a very selfish desire of mine to add piano to it. So one day I'm going to talk to the estates, and they're going to say no, but I'm going to do it, and they're going to sue me. So that's that. <laughs> I will say no more the rest of the session. <laughs> say no more. <laughs> Gladdy, how are you? Hey, what's up, guys? Good. Good to see everybody. It's yeah, Donnie, Donnie there and Martha and Tim yeah. and Alan Childs. What what a great bunch of people. I, I, I wish David was here. We could go on the road. With the virus, I'd take a chance if he was here. I'd, I'd be like Trump. I'd go without the mask and play anything to play with him again. But I won't say Trump again. I won't say Trump again. I won't say Trump again. Well, uh, so we're waiting for Carmine, and um, we're sad that Gal couldn't be with us, but hopefully she's watching, and we love you. Well, how many and, bass players do you need to change a light bulb? You know? Well, so I think when we posted this at first, some people thought it was going to be a concert, and they're like, they wow, it's going to be really bass heavy. <laughs> Very bass heavy. The only concert you're going to get is here. Uh, That's it. That's all I know. Welcome to the Lounge Lizards. That's it. So, uh, yeah. Mark, where are you? What are you doing? I'm in New York. I've been here the whole time. In Twilight Zone. What street are you on? All that free parking. Oh, man, it was a thing. That's going away, though. It is. Do you know why it's going away? Because all the restaurants are building out into the streets. You, 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 the mixing board looks great and the studio looks great. Everything is up to date. You need any repairs or you're good? Uh, I've been good. I've been, I've been working the whole time. I was really, really lucky that uh, when this whole thing hit, I was in the middle of three different projects and they were kind of, you know, long-term things. So I've been lucky that I've been, I've been working. That's wonderful. Yes, wonderful. Knock on wood is right. Yeah. So you have a Neve thing there too? You got some of those things? It is. It's a different Neve designs. Um, yes. Sorry, I'm getting spam. Yeah. Anybody notice that spam came back? There was no phone spam for like two months. I've been getting a lot of spam. All of a sudden it came, whoof, came back. Yep. And most of it says account services. Uh -huh. So I don't answer. I got some Chinese ones. Oh, lots of yeah. mine is coming in. Ah, yep. um, uh, wait, what? Ah, oh, hey, another the third one from Brooklyn. 
We don't hear you, stupid face. Put the fucking mic on. <laughs> Wait, he's, he's still connecting. That's all right. Give him a chance. He's process. He's, he's, a chance. Task he's, a, he's a handsome guy. So almost. All right. Okay. okay. Are you there? Yeah. Uh, I'm hey, here. Carmine. Hey. Hey. Come on. I, I apologize. I really thought it was four in the afternoon. West Coast time. Uh, which so which time zone are you in? I'm in uh, Pacific time. I'm glad it was not a concert. So don't mind me. Hey Tim. I'm glad it wasn't a concert and I had to play bass lines on the keyboard. Oh no, not that again. <laughs> Does that even when you're there though? Mark. Hey, what's up? Who's the, who's the one on the bottom? Is that Tim? Tim. Everybody's in different places. It depends on the screen. Tim, oh, yeah. Tim, give a wave. Come on, you're growing a beard. Well, shit, I was going to shave. Look, look kind of Puerto Rican for you guys, but that, I said, <laughs> you know, fuck it. <laughs> <laughs> so, Gani, Gani? I haven't needed a haircut. I haven't needed a haircut, fortunately. Have yeah, you? I just, I just decided to grow and just, you know, quarantine time and look <laughs> a little dusty. Yeah, mine went all white. I don't know what. Oh, you did good. Look at you. I think you're gonna get a big fro or something, you know. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so, then. I think I'm set up. I think I'm like this is gonna be it. I mean, hi guys. Cool. Yeah. Oh, oh, welcome, welcome, welcome. Wait, so, so did welcome. any of you know some of you played together in in bands, but but not all together at the same time, right? You were all in different yes, times. Yes, true, and true. I mean, um, for years I always wanted to play with Mike, and never got a chance to until the last few years. So it's been absolutely you know, wonderful. That's been great. Yeah. Yeah, when we did the Glass Spider tour, I was hoping Mike would have been on that. Well, he was supposed to. I was supposed to be there. I didn't know that. Yeah, Mike was supposed to do that. Another regret. <laughs> that, was, that was my first Bowie concert. I was, I was in high school. It, they, you guys played at Foxborough Stadium. Yes. Oh, I remember the gig. Yeah. Tell me that again. Tell me that again. Yeah. I, that was like my first, well, I, I lived right behind there in Foxborough, Mass. So like I went to that show and you know, it was also, wasn't it Lenny Pickett on that gig and Peter Frampton? Well, the, uh, Frampton, Frampton was, the Glass Spider tour. You talking about the year's Moonlight? No, Glass Spider. Yeah, 87. Yeah. That was uh, with Peter Frampton. Um, Lenny was on uh, the Sears Moonlight tour. Yeah, I saw, I saw the Glass Spider one for sure. Amazing. Yeah, yeah the oh, big spider on top and bunch of dances, people running around like acting crazy. Back then, that was mind boggling. It was, it was, it was wicked. Yeah, it was, it was a lot going on, man. It was like, it's, I, I, we feel it should have been in a theater for a week, like on Broadway, because it's so much to see, even with the film, yeah. the actual DVD, it's, it's so much going on, but um, it was a lot going on. People swinging by, you gotta be careful where you're walking, you know? I, people, I, high, I, people high up on the stage too. Yeah, yeah. I, I know the guy, the guy who, who booked that tour, you know, I was at Tedeschi Trucks for years, but Wayne Forte booked that tour. I'm, yeah, I'm, Wayne. Yeah, the agent. Yeah, so he, yeah, exactly. So he, you know, he, tell, he was telling me stories about that, that Bowie's first stadium tour. We had yeah, the was, same problem with Diamond Dogs. Exactly. And, been, uh, and the setup was two or three days. And just when we were getting warmed up, it was like a Broadway setup, and how do you set up another day in another town? We should have been there for a week, and it, it's, it's, yeah. it's terrible, you know? Yeah, we were, we were leapfrogging, so it, it was a little easier, but it still was, was so much stuff to drag around. Right, we had two, two sets. Yeah, two sets. Yeah. So we oh. to the next, you know. yeah, we had that too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I saw the Diamond Dogs tour. Uh, you were probably 24. three years old, three years yeah, old? Three, yeah, three and a half. <laughs> yeah. You're all, so much, you're all so much younger than me, you could be my ch children. <laughs> Hi, Dad. <laughs> hey, remember in, in Switzerland, Iggy Pop, you know, the spider had these legs that went all the way down to the bottom of the stage. And backstage, Iggy Pop opened for us in Switzerland, and uh, he started licking the legs of the spider. Pretty <laughs> gross. God bless Iggy. It sounds normal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's why, we're all, that's why we're all quarantined, because we're perverts. Yeah. <laughs> Licking the legs of something. Oh, the legs. <laughs> but don't go there now. Yeah. <laughs> Mark, how are you, brother? What's up, sir? 
How are you? Mark you is mixing as we're talking. He's not listening to us. <laughs> yeah, he's watching the mix. <laughs> he's, he's, got, he's got an even tied plug in up, and he's, just, <laughs> he's got a midget behind him. He's got a midget behind him. He's got the, he's got the black hole <laughs> thing going. He's got the reverb, so he's hearing us in reverb in triple. <laughs> There's a delay somewhere. <laughs> it's always time to make the donuts. Donnie, uh, you get to practice the saxophone in Atlanta? Yeah, I do. Um, you know, I think the the challenge, you know, with this situation is sometimes, you know, what to focus on, you know, to, to move, for me, to move myself forward musically, you know, and because and, um, for so many years, it's just been oriented around playing live and sort of preparing for, these different original you know, music situations. So I think part of the challenge for me has been like, how do I stay engaged? And a couple of times I've had, you know, I've been hired to, to do recordings or, you know, so that was something to focus on. Right. But outside of that, you know, I've had different periods of like, okay, I'm gonna work on, you know, playing free, playing a solo piece for a while. Um, honestly, one thing I've, I've been doing a lot of is actually playing tunes in 12 keys. Oh like my God. Bird wow. example. And because they're hard. And, and I, I think. Harmonies, when, yeah. You know, like when you're just sitting there, okay, well, what am I practicing towards? If I'm doing something like that, it, it, it's really tangible. And it, and it, and I have, it's like all hands have to be on deck. And I can't just kind of go through, you know, something I've already practiced and my mind is wandering, but like I really have to focus. So that's, <clears throat> I, I, I worked a little bit with Eddie Harris and he told me he used to practice in 12 keys. And, and he told me George Coleman used to do everything in 12 keys. And then, then when I was working with Stanley Clark, he was a bunch of guys came over and they were all playing giant step in 12 keys. I couldn't even play in one fucking key, you know? So <laughs> I just pushed the button on my computer and it's in 12 keys and I call Platy and he writes out the part for me. <laughs> well, well. <laughs> you know, yeah. to, to keep saying during these crazy times, uh, for me, I'm just recording almost every day. Just to keep it's to keep sane and creative. To keep sane, yes, yeah, it's, it's the best thing to do. Donnie, did you did did you know uh, of the teacher back in the day named Joe Allen who taught many sax players? Yeah, I did, and, and um, he was too young. Well, he was just he was just sort of retiring at the New England Conservatory when I showed up in Boston, and I started studying with with Joe Viola, who was at Berkeley, and I had a couple friends. BC who studied with Joe Allard and you know I got a little some wisps of information but unfortunately I never got to to work with him you were a little too young I know he had that um that European classical sound I remember a bunch of my friends used to go study with him I, I grew up with Dave Liebman so he he was one of the guys but I think Mike also Brecker might have gone over to him and well, that's what I yeah. remember is both of those guys working with Allard um, you, you heard some of those stories? Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know if Steve Grossman uh, studied with him. Uh, he's still around? Steve's still around, you know. He, he's, he's, I don't know. He might even be in the East Coast. I haven't seen him in years, but we used to jam every Sunday when he was 14. Sounded like uh, Charles McPherson, right? 15, he sounded like early train, 16, late train, 17, like Sonny Rollins, 18. I don't know. He was working with Elvin, and I sat in with him with Elvin back then. And then I haven't seen him. Those fifty years have passed, you know. I have a um, a, a comment that I think we should address at the, this moment. People are apparently writing in and saying, "When is the reunion tour happening?" Twenty fifty. Yeah, good, good question. I'll be. I'll be. Well, but Mike, you were you were supposed to be on tour now with your with your. Bowie celebration, so and that some of you guys are were in that. Are you trying to pour the salt on the wound? <laughs> <laughs> but it's going to happen again. Well, all I can do now is I started from the beginning. In twelve this keys. One. <laughs> Sometimes I play them in two keys. But anyway, I like that distortion. But listen, I was hoping to be on tour even this September, but 
it's, it's, I can't risk the band and their families and the audience, you know, if we were playing maybe outdoor arenas or something like that, but we're not big enough to do that. So we'll just wait till it calms down. In my mind, I need to see 2 billion people vaccinated. That's right. the only thing I know as of now. And um, I'm hoping there's other paradigms that come in that uh, it's above my pay grade, the science world. And, but it just seems to me, I'm going to just be in this house here writing music. I've never, I've never composed so much and arranged so much. I, I, I'm busier than ever. Uh, you might call it the uh, miracle of the virus, but I'm not unaware of the suffering that's going out there and it kills me, you know, and, and, and it's embarrassing that to be in a country that has such bad statistics and I'm hoping we could straighten that out. You know, it's frightening. Yeah, we were having a great time, weren't we? We were having a great time. <laughs> we, we, we finished six shows and we had done 12 in Europe. The virus was probably there, but we were very lucky. Uh, we did six shows, we had 24 to complete. And, uh, you know, it got pulled. Our agency wanted us we were in Seattle when the virus broke out. That show got canceled, so we're sitting there, and the agency wanted us to go off to Vancouver. I actually pulled the plug, and within five hours, I had everyone on a plane to either London or Canada or New York or L.A. because I saw danger. It was more intuitive at the time because nobody really knew what was to come, and uh, thank God everyone got home. But I will say that... Our other guitarist, Kevin Armstrong, who, who, who played with David in different times and wrote the outside track with him, he, he actually got COVID, uh, but he was okay. But we lost some of our other friends. He had one guitar player, play, uh, I think it might have been from the Gang of Four, and they were in China, and that guitarist died. Uh, so, and, but they didn't know it was COVID-19. They said he died from a respiratory thing was because, before they figured out, but he was actually performing in China. I, I, I'm sorry, but I forgot his name. Gail would know because she worked with them. But well, Kevin has taken their place in Gang of Four, but again, they can't tour right now like any of us. You know? So it, it, it's, it's sad, but I think when we all return, People are going to be out there really appreciating the music. You won't get that lackadaisical, lackadaisical bullshit that you get in New York or L.A. when you play a concert and show us what you can do, as opposed to when we play in Bosnia and the people just come out of a war. They really appreciate it. I think everyone in the world will appreciate live music because there's fucking Zoom squares I'm getting tired of. <laughs> I'm already tired. The only thing is I've gotten better playing with a click. I must say, I look on the grid and the computer, my time is better, Mark. <laughs> that works. It better. It works. Yeah, when do we, how long do we think this is going to, anybody have any kind of idea at all how this no. is going to go? Because no. I think that's what's killing all of us, this unknown. <laughs> it, it, it's, there's so much missing data, my gut yeah. tells me two years. It's also a banana republic out there, like nobody's setting the rules. So like, you know, every, I have to leave my team. Yeah. Oh, I'm, I'm muted. Sorry. Uh, Oh no! Well, we not supposed to go. I'm just saying, like you know, since it's since it's kind of every man for himself out there. The long, you know, since there's no firm mandate from the federal government. I mean, you know, this is gonna like we're gonna get, we're about to get banned from Europe. You saw all that, right? Yeah. yeah. Europe. It's like it's like that was worrying to me. That was really yeah. As somebody that yeah. has a lot over there, I was like, well, <laughs> twenty one at the earliest. Do you think that, I mean, this is a new paradigm. Um, I, mean, you, I mean, I've been trying to think of ways that I can collaborate with other people online. I know we can't, you know, play, if we all played directly, it, was, it would be a, a kind of a mess, but there's other ways to, to collaborate and think of different ways of, of creating and, and, you know, and doing performances. I mean, it's not, it's not ideal and I very much miss the, you know, the audiences, which the audiences are as, are as much a part of the performance as the you know the people on the stage. Um, I think it's fantastic. So, the, what's the that? Was the driving idea was it's really fantastic and strange. Drive car, driving, you sit in your car and watch the show. I guess well that's the the closest yeah. so far. Yeah, that, that was that's very strange in Europe, but it's working for them. But it's, again, you still got to keep your distance as much as possible. You mean a drive-in concert? 
Yeah, like a tribe, like a tribe in theater. Yeah. The tribe is across the country. They've been doing shows, festivals. I mean, but you know, the bottom line is, is like, you know, you can't bring in the same revenue that way. So it's no, like, no, bad for us. And yeah. how do you bring? And how would you string dates enough dates together? <laughs> that's a whole nother operation. <laughs> I think one of the things about this that's um, also hard, you know, it's 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 not as you guys know, it's not only the question of when when are people going to feel safe to come back to a space, but also what is the infrastructure going to look like? Is how long can these theaters and performing arts centers and clubs, how, how long can they hold on and what kind of, you know, assistance are they going to get from the, from the city or the state or the federal right. government? I mean, it's, that's also really yeah. going to destabilize, I think, this <laughs> for, Zero. Yeah. For, for, you know, for the live touring musician. I mean, it's, 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 uh, so Tim is correct about the Banana Republic. I mean, it's it's uh, until that's really organized and tight and supportive, you know, following down the line. It's just we we're we're in limbo. A lot of us are in limbo. We gotta get business. we gotta go back to the stagecoach <laughs> and, and hit every town. <laughs> <laughs> Um, we have another. We have another question from the from the audience. Um, are there people actually out there? We just. I think there are a few people other. out there. Yeah, they're they're waiting for the for the singer. <laughs> um, so they want to know: Was was David nervous before live shows? I could tell you from my experience. Um, yes, sometimes very, and, and occasionally, as people have heard me talk and other times there were times in his very biggest concerts or most important ones in 1973 at Hammersmith and in 2000 Glastonbury he would the last second send me out as the fucking guinea pig to play and warm up the audience to test if they're a good audience and I'd have to go out at Glastonbury he told me to play green sleeves and in London he told me to play a foggy day in London town <laughs> go out there and I think, these people don't know this song they don't want to see me platy would have a smile on his face when i do it a few oh, times yeah. but it was like uh, why he I chose me you know <laughs> but anyway yeah he yes he he was one of the things i always remember about him he was very different off stage something transformed when he went on stage and he was bigger than life and it's like he grew another set of limbs, mentally, physically, spiritually. He was great off stage and very funny and very warm and all of that, and a normal human being and cared about others. But the truth of the matter is, when he got on stage, you know, it seems like a, a, an entire force of angels or muses would come in because I've never seen anyone do what he did with his beingness in front of an audience. And I miss that terribly. It was really, I had done two albums with him before I ever played a gig. Oh, and really? So I never knew him in, in this live context. And I remember when I started playing with him, it was just like, that was a whole other thing. Like, just to be performing, you know, with him and hearing that voice come out and, and just, that was a whole other level to him that, you know, I didn't get in the studio because that's the way he, you know, I, I saw it on your face because I was behind you on the keyboards and you were in front of me, and I saw you. You were astounded. I remember having the thought. Well, there were a lot of trippy moments. I remember like uh, when Slick came back, and uh, you know, we were doing that first Roseland show uh, before as a Glastonbury warm up, and I, I think that was one of the coolest things we ever did. Oh my God! Yes. And I remember I'm in the middle of this triangle and I got David on one end and I've got you on one and I've got Slick on this side of me. And, and I can't believe I'm in the middle of that. And then I can't believe everyone's looking at me for like, when's the song going to end? <laughs> so you were the only one who could count straight. It was this double, like, you know, I'm, I'm, and I'm directing these guys. Like, this is, this is not happening. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Very, I believe it less now, that, less then than I did now. Now I kind of can't believe it all happened. 
it, it's very humbling from everyone's angle to tell you the truth and it's only history that shows the further we get away from when he passed away the more it becomes like legendary and legacy like and everyone treasures the stories donnie i'm sure you have them. martha you have them you know alan you know and carmine you know it's like we all have personal stories and and it's like the 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 things you treasure with because in a way we're very blessed to have had an opportunity to work with them each in our own way and 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 it, and it leaves like a, a deep imprint and in in a way that cream rose to the top that way and and who would have known at the time for me when i joined them in 72 it was like my jazz buddies were thinking, what are you doing? You're selling out and you're working with some rock idiot and, you know, you should be out playing in jazz club with us, Birdland, you know, and, and I thought to myself, I see something in this guy. Because on the Spiders from Mars tour, I only played 10 or 12 songs out of 20 because they were together a year and a half, two years before I joined. So when I wasn't playing a song, I would sneak out to the audience. This is 1972. And I'd find an empty seat in the first row and look at this guy and think, this guy is the real deal. And and I had to shed all my stupid jazz uh, fixed ideas of how this is a lower form of music. It's bullshit. This was actually a higher form, but you don't want to even compare. It just so happened artistry-wise, my realization was he was comparable to my heroes, such as Miles Davis and Coltrane. Those were my guys, you know, but in a whole different way. And it took me a while to get the sound in my head and the strange chord changes and the lack of upper chord changes, as Donnie knows, and, you know, Tim. It was just another way of thinking. And uh, I'm still learning, actually, you know. I, I, I When I hear his songs now, I, they sound better to me with him singing on them. When I listen to him, when you when you're being paid to do a gig, your job is just to do your part. You don't you don't even see the whole. At least I didn't. I didn't have the brain power. I just wanted to play the right notes for the guy. But now, even to watch YouTube things and see him from the front, I always saw him from the back. You know. Yeah. See, so, like Mark was, what Mark was talking about. Uh, when I met David at the first rehearsal for the, uh, we did a press conference tour for two weeks. Um, when he walked into the studio, we already learned two songs. And, and I was introduced to him and, I, and I, I didn't know what to say. And I was like, I have all your albums. Uh, I mean, I was, I was so nervous. And then when we started to play, I couldn't believe I was hearing his voice in my monitor. I mean, that was like one of those moments. Like, that's, that's the guy I listened to on the records. He's, oh. Yeah. I, you so. know, uh, people in, um, in YouTube land, are, they're following up on this, and, and maybe we could go around the room and everybody tell their stories when they first met David and what was first meeting like, uh, what surprised you the most, funny moments. So, um, Alan, can, yeah, continue, and then you pass it on to... Uh, yeah, sure. I got one funny moment. Um, so we rehearsed for a, a total of around two months before the actual tour started. And, you know, uh, we spoke, me and David and I spoke, and we started to get friendly. But, you know, I never spoke to him on the phone or anything. It was just at rehearsals, and we talked during the breaks. Then we did, the first concert was in Rotterdam. And after the show, we all went back to the hotel, and about midnight, my phone rings and it's, I pick it up and I, hello? Hello, Alan, it's David. And I'm thinking, do I know a David on the tour? Because <laughs> I would never expect David Bowie to call me. So I went, I'm David who? And he David, the singer in the band, you dummy. <laughs> okay, I guess you had to be there. Uh, <laughs> Hey, Carmine, yeah, I, what about you? Yeah, I mean, my first introduction to, I mean, I was going to Power Station to record the Let's Dance album, which we were unaware it was for him. So now Rogers called a bunch of us, 
uh, Omar Key, myself, Rob Sabino on keyboards um, as a rhythm section. And I walk into Power Station looking to find out which room it is. So as I walk in the room, I look to my left and there's a guy in there, blondish hair with a hat on. And, I'm, and in my head, I'm going, some big old, <laughs> excuse me for saying, some big old Bowie looking motherfucker in the corner somewhere, but I guess it's just in the room. So I walk out the room and the engineer walks in, walks after me going, hey, Carmine, this is the room you're working in. I said, oh, okay, okay. So who's that, who's that big old fake looking David Bowie guy? And this is a true story. He goes, that's David Bowie. I said, what? I said, well, now Roger is here. Yeah. <laughs> well, Roger says, yeah, you're, we're in here working like a private project. I said, are you sure? And I'm, I'm a, I've been a big fan since the 70s. You're watching Diamond Dogs Tour and a couple other ones. I'm going, it can't be him. So as I walk in, I don't know whether to curtsy, put my hand out, or run to a corner, because I wouldn't, I'm not going, what the fuck do I do? You know, it's like, this is, you know, Bowie, and he's right in front of you. He's got a great cap on, this amazing smile, you know, that pulls you right in. And he comes up to you, and I wouldn't, I just, I'm not going, you know, what do I do? So he puts his hand out, and, and you know, says, welcome. And the first thing out of my head kept, was, um, what are you doing here? <laughs> he goes, I was just working on a little project, trying to, you know, trying to look for the future. I said, oh, man. I said, you invented the future. I said, he goes, thank you. Thank you for that. So I sit back. And I'm going, I look for Niall, because I know Niall, we grew up together from Bronx and Brooklyn. I'm going, is this for real? You know? And then Omar Akeem comes in, and he goes, He said, what's he doing here? I mean, we're all saying, what's he doing here? I said, we're on a project with him. And the first song we started out was, uh, I think, was uh, Modern Love. We started working on it. Wow. And it was just, it was just rhythm section, just piano, Niles, myself, and Omar getting, this, getting the, organizing the songs together. And it was still weird because we kept looking at him going, it's really him. <laughs> so it's, it's very strange, but, but very, very, he brings you in. He's always mm -hmm. been you know, just very polite, very beautiful, and completely opposite from what you expect someone to be. And we were there, we were there five days straight a week doing cutting the tracks. And um, again, the whole week was, wow, this can't be for real, you know. And I said, I hope this album, I hope this thing happens, you know. I hope, hope it comes to comes to some sort of light. But yeah, my first introduction was like, nah, it's a ghost, you know. This can't be the real person, you know. You know the same thing, Carmine. In that first rehearsal for the press tour, I mean, he didn't, he never heard me play. Carlos, Carlos. Oh, yeah. yeah. And I'm thinking while we're playing the first of two or three songs, maybe he doesn't like me. <laughs> no, it's like, does he like me? Is he happy? And you know what? This was unbelievable. It's like he knew what I was thinking. Because during the second song, because he was facing us, if right. you remember right. And uh, during the second song, I'm playing and I looked at him and he looked back at me and he went, thumbs up. Yeah. I was like, how did he know? Yeah. Consider it. It's Very just one of those kind of guys, you know, just, yeah. just at the end of my conversation, it's just, you know, you, you, you have heroes that you look up to and then when you finally meet them, they're not that kind of a hero. David was absolutely that kind of person through and through. You know, just majestic, beautiful, creative, you know, from, from every level of music. Funny. It's, it's Funny. Yeah, just, it was, it's amazing schooling to be a part of and, and to be a part of the gang with Tim and everybody else and Mark, you know, it's just, it's, just, it's an honor to play with all the guys. The gang is a club. It's a club. <laughs> <laughs> Mark, what's your story? What's my story? Oh, man. Well, I met him in, a, in the capacity of uh, as, as an engineer and synth programmer guy. So it was a little bit different because um, uh, I was sort of based out of Philip Glass's studio then. And, and he and Reeves just came to check it out as a place to maybe do some work and they liked it. And I was sort of the in-house-ish rock person. So kind of came to me since I knew the place so well. And, uh, we were working on just a song he was working on called Telling Lies. And uh, 
I don't know. We just kind of got on like a house on fire. We all had a real similar kind of, I guess, work ethic and, you know. What song, what song were you working on? Telling Lies. Oh, great okay. song. I just wrote a song called Telling Lies. Very different, but it's called Telling Lies 88. Right. Orange hair. I'll send it to you. It's not something you would sing in the shower, but it's, it's only one minute. <laughs> it's dedicated to somebody on the in the government, but I'm not going to say who. Continue, Mark. Okay, keep going, Mark. <laughs> I lost my train of thought. Where was I? Oh. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, so it was different for me because I was I had to direct a session. I was like, okay, now you time to go sing. Now we need and and things like that. So I kind of. Um, I had to keep my head in that space just because that was what I was supposed to do. But uh, it's like everybody else would say, you know, he'd be sort of in the back of the room and I'd turn around to just say something and the light would hit him just right. And I'd go, shit, Ziggy. It would just hit me over the head like, whoa, you know, and I'd be, all right, Ziggy, time to sing. It'd be kind of, you know, uh, and, you know, I, I totally get the whole, you know, the, Things Karma was saying very, you know, majestic, etc. But um, the flip side of that was like just how how funny the whole thing was. I mean, we got on like a house on fire. I mean, we spent five weeks in Ireland. Reeves and David and I spent five weeks in Ireland together. Three of those weeks, the three of us in a room no bigger than my place, uh, working on pre-production. And you know, three guys in a room. I don't care who those guys are. You got three guys locked in a room. It's going to get stupid. And it really got stupid. It was just really funny, um, the things that uh, would go on. Uh, there was just made me think of one thing where there was this one producer I used to work with a lot, and uh, he could never spell my name, ever. And I'd get like the, the, the record of the CD, and my name is wrong again. And I got, and, and one arrived during a session. And I just said, damn, and I fling it across the room. Uh, and then David looks down at the table. He picks up CDs and he starts flinging them all over too. <laughs> I'm like, what are you doing? He goes, oh, I thought that's what we were supposed to be doing now. <laughs> Things like this all the time. He was just, um, it was just so much fun in addition to all the rest of it. Um, so it'd just be completely goofy and then David Lynch would show up or somebody of this magnitude. It was just like, wow. Um, okay. It was a constantly, you know, interesting experience. Yeah. I'm jealous of every experience that I hear from you guys that I wasn't there for. You know, you think about that yeah, people, yeah. I know when I was there and where I was there, but I also know when I wasn't there. Like Donnie, for example, tell us how you guys met. with, Because I think I had something to do with that because of... Uh, Marie Schneider, because yeah, he yeah. asked me a few years earlier about who's the best big band, and I said the one I like. And then the next day later, he came back and he kind of blew me off. He said, "Nah," and I said, "Just trust me." And then the next, the rest is history. So fill in those blanks for me. Yeah, sure. Well, um, I, I've been in Maria's band for a while, and and she was actually getting ready to make a record, which is a really, you know, uh, totally comprehensive process for her, and. But she called me and she, at one point. She said, you know, somebody from David Bowie's camp reached out to me about doing something. And I'm, you know, not sure because I have this record. And, you know, and um, I remember saying, you know, I, I think you should do it. I mean, he's totally killing and this could be a really interesting thing, so on and so forth. So, um, yeah, so she she went, went, went forward with that and, and they started meeting. I think he was going to her apartment and they were working on that tune, Sue. And at some point in the process, um, she called me and, and said, say, you know, David was um, trying to describe the rhythmic underpinning to what he's hearing on Sue, and it reminded me of your band. So you know, he said, I put on a record of yours, and I said, hey, you should, you know, you should do something with Donnie's band. You know, and, and, um, and I said, man, cool, thank you. <laughs> you know, and, and, and it kind of went from there. And then I talked to her a couple, maybe a week later, um, because I was involved, you know, I was giving her feedback on, on the piece that they were doing and sort of planning the rehearsals and whatnot. And so she said, hey, I, you know, I, uh, I mentioned again to David that I think he should do something with you. Um, and then, you know, a couple of weeks later, she said, hey, we're going to come hear you guys play. Uh, so they came to hear us play 
uh, Tim was there, Mark Julian and Jason Linner, and we were playing at the 55 bar. And I, you know, I mean, I saw them come in. Um, oh, no, I didn't. I just saw them in the audience at one point, but I didn't actually meet them that night. And it was about a week later when we had the first workshop for the Maria David collaboration of Sue or In a Season of Crime. That's where I met him for the first time. So it was like Mark was playing drums, Jay Anderson on bass, Ryan Keverly on trombone, myself, Maria, Tony Visconti, uh, Coco was there, and David. And, and that's where we met for the first time. And it was, um, you know, three or four hours working on that arrangement. And, and uh, yeah, I mean, of course, I was, um, you know, I guess, you know, a little, a little sort of starstruck and everything, but, but the similar theme from what you guys have all mentioned was there. And it's really great to hear your guys' stories because it's, you know, uh, it was the same thing. You know, he was really present, uh, just a total gentleman, you know, uh, great, really put me at ease, you know, and, and, and it was just such a great vibe being with him from the first moment, you know, I just felt like he's just such a genuine person and he's so utterly hated to realizing his musical vision and not settling for anything else. And all of that, I mean, it just sort of was um, sort of a harbinger of what was to come, which would, all of that was, was, was um, reaffirmed, you know, as we, as we worked together. And, and um, I've told the story before, but the first day we were in the studio, before we even played a note, you know, he just, said to me, you know, I want you to just go for whatever you're hearing. You know, don't, don't, you know, don't be afraid if it's called rock or jazz or whatever, let's have, fun. but I want you to, I want you to just do whatever you want, basically. And you, you know, you can't ask for a more creative environment to work in, you know, and that was, and that was where he set the bar and, and, uh, and it went from there. So. Yeah. Yeah. Did you ever play saxophone? Um, never, never live with me, but on some of the demos that he sent, um, he, he's playing saxophone. I mean, in fact, do you guys know the version of Tis a Pity She Was a Whore that came out on the B-side of the Maria David version of Sue? If you're familiar with that, it's, it's yeah. the vinyl. That's, that's David playing saxophone and, and everything else, as you probably know. Um, and, and he did that at home. And that was, the, that was actually the first thing he sent me. Uh, and then, um, yeah, he played saxophone on a few other things. And we wow. talked about it, of course, but, um, but unfortunately, I never got to hear him play. Wow. T T Tim, tell us your connection, because you've been the quietest so far. Well, I, I can tell you this. I got a couple of things, but, but uh, the gig that David Bowie came to see us at the 55 bar, which I didn't know he was coming, um, for me personally, it was an epic disaster. Like, like I was getting <laughs> unplugged from the wall. Like I was using the wrong cabinet, so like it was exploding. Like for me, it was like the the worst set I had ever played. You know, with, oh, the, with seriously, like my, like seriously, the power's falling out. It was exploding the app. It was just the worst. And <laughs> I was just like, okay, good. They're going to use everybody else on that record, but not me, because because oh. we knew. Uh, you know, we had an idea that he was interested in using us. So I was just like, well, blew that one. But uh, but then, you know, like when we when we started doing Black Star, it was it was inter it was cool because basically a lot of it was one or two takes from me and Mark Giuliano. We were done. Like we'd be like would be the, the conservative take, just go, you know, play through the tune. And then the second one would be like with all the ideas we had just discussed from the first take. So like, you know, a lot of it like Lazarus happened that way, a whole, bu whole bunch of things. But uh so basically, you know, the, a lot of the day was spent on the couch with David. Me and Mark were done. Donnie and, and uh, Jason Linder would be doing overdubs. And so we'd just be bullshitting on the couch. And, and, <laughs> and uh, yeah, I, he's an incredibly sharp, witty guy. Like, he was kicking my ass. It was, it was great. Well, I really had a good time, like, just hanging with him. And, you know, I like, you know, it's one of those things where you could be yourself. Like, you know, I'm, I'm from Boston. I'm rough and tumble, blue collar kind of guy. So like, I just kind of threw that at him. And, you know, just, of course, in the first couple of days, it's like, oh, hi, Mr. Bowie. But, uh, but after that, I was just like, yeah, yeah. Oh, man. And it was just like, that. it was just on. And it was, we had a blast. It was, it was really cool. And, and then- uh, Jason I, did a great job, by the way, of, of his parts, they're wonderful. Yeah, yeah, he did, he did great. So anyway, that's, that's my story. I'm sticking that's, to it. That's, that's, you know, there's a really a common thread, right? Yeah, he's a great casting director. 
Martha, tell us some of yours because you played viola on a few tracks, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, actually, I met I met David in two thousand one, um, and I had been doing some string sessions for Tony Visconti, and um, I just keep, you know, Tony is my mentor, and um, and so I was creating us a, a, um, a new music series for ASCAP that was called Through the Walls, and it was. ASCAP composer performers who were doing music that kind of defied cate categorization. Like we weren't doing classical, we weren't doing rock, we were doing everything in between, which is like commonplace now, but 20 years ago it wasn't as. And um, we, we uh, did the first one at the cutting room, the, the original cutting room on, on 26th Street. And I invited Tony to be the, the host, the guest host, because he totally got the whole thing. He, you know, he'd done everything and his arranged string arrangements are just fabulous. And so the, the day of, I was talking with, with Tony and, and um, he, was, he, he does the Alexander technique and he was helping me, you know, cause I was a little nervous. And he's like, well, I, I told my friend David about this concert tonight and he said he might come. And I said, right. And so I was, I was scheduled to perform and I was introducing the whole thing. It was the kickoff event and um, uh, ben Neal was playing his mutant trumpet and Neil Baglarian was playing some stuff. And so we get to the cutting room, we're setting up and they turn the lights down and, and like one minute before the show starts, they escort David over to my table and he sits right in front of me with Coco and we're introduced and then Tony gets up and does the introduction. And um, a couple of days later, I got a phone call from Tony and he said, David wants to know if you can put a string quartet together to play with him at Carnegie Hall for the Tibet House Benefit concert that Philip Glass produces. And I said, let me, okay. <laughs> you know? um, and yes, and I did. And, and uh, it was just the most thrilling experience. Um, we, you know, we, we got together with, at Looking Glass at Philip's studio and, and David came in, it's a tiny studio. We rehearsed with the quartet. And we rehearsed heroes. I mean, you know, how, how amazing, for, you know, to play heroes on the stage of Carnegie Hall with David Bowie. Um, so it was just a really spectacular experience. And, and that led to doing some other recordings, which we did with you, right, Mark? We did, it was supposed to be Toy. And uh, we did some sessions and, and, um, and then we recorded, we worked with him on Heathen. We recorded a bunch of tracks on Heathen and um and then we played two more years with david at carnegie hall at the tibet house benefit concerts and it was just amazing all the way through so uh yeah one cool really cool thing that i mean you know it was like when david walked into the in, into the green room at carnegie hall he had been sort of you know he had long stringy hair at that point when he when he walked in for the uh, you know just before the show started at carnegie like there was David Bowie, larger than life. He had this gorgeous, shiny, uh, silver um, um, uh, coat on, and, and his hair was done, and a little bit of, you know, his hair, face was just, just magical. And uh, when we get on stage, we played two songs with him. Little Boy Blue was the other one. And the monks had given him um, a beautiful silk scarf before the show started. And while he was singing, I think it was Little Boy Blue, um, the, the scarf got wrapped up with the microphone somehow. And so I was watching that. I was sitting, you know, right off to the side of him. And I'm seeing how is he going to get through, you know, he's not going to sit there and unwrap his, you know, the scarf. So what he did, it was so elegant. He took the scarf off and he just so benevolently wrapped it around. He made a ceremony out of it and wrapped the microphone with this with the scarf and then he left the stage mm -hmm. and it was you know it was so magical so uh, yeah i still get goosebumps when i think of those those amazing times and, uh, hey martha uh, i was curious um about the string arrangements um did you tell me about that like you know the did you do it or, you know, what was, what happened there? So all the arrangements for the quartet uh, were Tony Visconti. Okay. And so he, and, you know, he had them all printed up for us. Um, 
for uh, for both the live performances and also on Heathen. So we play on a bunch of tracks there. Yeah. Um, the only thing that wasn't done ahead of time was I actually went up to Alaire, the studio up in, near Woodstock, and this was the weekend before 9-11. Okay. And, um, and I went up with my electric um, viola and some effects and stuff, and David Torn had been there doing some electric guitar effects and things. And, and so I you know, did some plucky things and um, put out, put down a few tracks with the electric viola and a, and a solo which didn't get on the full uh, CD, but it got onto the Mo Moby's mix of uh, Sunday. Cool. That's a great song, Sunday. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So, so um, let's see. Okay, more questions. Um, what's everybody's favorite Bowie album? <laughs> That's hard to do. <laughs> that's, that's tough. So David called me in 1998 and he said, uh, can you do some bigger big band arrangements for me? I want to take, there was, he had done 26 albums at that point. And he said, I would like to take the least known song on each of my 26 albums and do it with the big band. I said, okay, I'm in. But you know, David, had a million ideas that one never came to fruition but i'm gonna eventually do it you know but the point is it, that's the way the guy was you know and then just the fact that he would find me in 1972 and find donnie and tim and jason in in, in 2000 and what 15 was it 14 you know and and marie and Platty there and Carmine there and you there and you know Carlos then and Mick Ronson then and Slick then and Jerry Leonard then. I mean, how does that happen? You know, that in itself is genius casting director on a musical things, you know. I mean, I've had a fifty bands that I've played with separate from David and they weren't all special. <laughs> And some of the musicians, the bass players, and drummers, I hated, you know. He never had bad musicians, you know. I mean, I, even when we auditioned drummers for Young Americans Tour, you know, there was Dennis Davis, there was Andy Newmark, there was Rick Murata. They were all there auditioning. And I'm thinking, we have to make a decision? You know, they're all great, you know. Use them all, you know. And I used to always ask them to use two drummers because Zach Alford had done a lot of work with us in the 90s, and then Sterling continued on. And at one point, I wanted them both. But again, not all my wishes came true. I also talked to him, let's do an album of standards, just me and you and orchestra. He'd done a few things along the way, Nature Boy and this one and that one. He said, nah, Rod Stewart's done that, and I don't want to do it. He, he never wanted to do anything that was in any way copy-like of anybody else. So... Uh, he talked to me about way before Lazarus doing a, a musical uh, Broadway together. So these are, these are, I think I have a lot of regrets today. I'm not in, a, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's just like you think about these things that could have been, you know what I mean? But um, so, you know, it felt to me like the life was cut short, but no life is cut short. It is what it's supposed to be. And, and, and he moved on, you know, but it was, uh, these things I fantasize about, you know, even, yeah, even, know. even when you did Sue, Donnie and, and, and with Marisha, oh my God, I heard what I would have played on piano on that. I mean, I, I'm still hearing it, you know what I mean? But it's my own fault because David in, in 2005 asked me to move to New York to sort of be his sidekick like he had with Reeves or Mark or, you know, Mick Ronson. And, you know, my whole family was in New York. I was willing to come two weeks out of every month and stay at a friend's place, something like that. He really wanted me there. And I think he was upset that I didn't do it, you know. It's like David Bowie asking you, you know. But, you know, I have a wife and kids and grandkids. I just couldn't do it. So I missed some of those opportunities on Next Day and, and, and Black Star. But I'm grateful for the other 20 albums, you know. And, and, and they keep I keep hearing new things that keep coming out. I think that sounds like me, you know, when did we do that, you know, and so that's the good news, you know, so many cool stuff, things are coming out from all the stuff we did in the 90s, Mark, right, and these recordings, yeah, and, and, 
It's, it's, and, and, and then there was a bunch of stuff, the Glaus, Gauster or something like that we did at the time of Young Americans, great tracks. Obviously, he didn't think they were good enough at the time to put them in the Young Americans album. When you listen to them now, uh, they sound wonderful, you know. So, you know, I, I shouldn't be regretful about the things I didn't play on, because, but when you realize he didn't do anything bad. You wanted to be on them all, you know. Call it greed, but you know, it's just it's just the magnificence of wanting to play the the music, you know, with him, you know. Uh, I mean, before I joined him, I had already played for about nine hundred singers because I was like just a pianist in the Catskill Mountains, and every night was a different singer from the worst to Mel Torme, you know, to you know, God knows who, you know, and. And then he comes along and it's like he's here and the next closest one is here and then it went downwards you know and in the last four years i've worked with a hundred singers with these alumni things from the most amazing singers joe elliott and simon lebon and sting and, and and lord every one of them are great but there was something about a magic he had that I haven't encountered anyone else. And it's not fair to compare. So when I put a band together, I just want to just um, acknowledge the beauty of the songs and whoever's there give their heart out. Which brings me to an interesting thing. I probably shouldn't be revealing it, but because I can't tour starting in January again, I had a whole big tour. It's his fifth year of passing and I'm putting together quite a show where we'll be in a space without an audience with, I can't tell you how many alumni, as many <laughs> that are as alive, maybe I'll even call the dead ones in, but, but, but it's just like, I have this thing, I've been putting it all together, I haven't spread the word yet, but just know you guys will all be involved and, and I'm working on it fiercely for the last few months, but the mechanics of doing it is, is quite involved, but I will pull it off and the fans will get a show on his birthday like they have never seen. And I'm doing what I was planning on doing over a hundred shows in one show with 50 alumni and 30 singers. And I hope I could pull it off, God willing, you know, but it, 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 it's, it's, it's real. It's not just pie in the sky. And so that's the only good news I have regarding performing, so to speak, and, and really doing something of his fifth year. Hopefully the year after, I will be touring around the world for his 75th birthday, which it would have been. And that already, I'm hearing that in my head. But right now I'm concentrating on uh, January 8th for, you know, five years. And uh, that's all I know. <laughs> well, that's something I'll wait for. So one thing I want to tell you that's funny is Mark Platty, I used to drive him crazy when he was the music director on the tour. I was such a pain in the ass, and I played so many notes just to piss him off, and I apologize, Mark, but I had so much fun. <laughs> Can't take him back, though, Mike. <laughs> Can't, take back. Can't take it back. Like I say, there's only 12 notes, and you either go up or you go down. Maybe you make a left turn, and you find something in between. You bend it like the, the guitar players, but... Uh, whatever they were, I found them and I would just play them and you just wanted me to play the fucking parts that I played on the album and I just... <laughs> <laughs> but that's the beauty of playing live, isn't it? You know, you, you get to expand on it and make it come alive, that it's not just, you're not just playing the record. Of, of every artist I've ever worked with, David, like what Donnie said, gave me the most freedom. You know, one time I pissed him off because I, I played some intros and it brought him in in the wrong key because I just took it out, you know. So he, ah. he said, Mike, I have one favor. Just get yeah. me in key and go out on the right intro. Do what the fuck you want in the middle. I and, remember that. Uh, uh, you remember that, Mark, right? That was and, and, girl. I, and that was it. That was it, you know. But he really yeah. allowed me a lot of freedom. And, you know, if someone trusts you, at least I've experienced when I'm trusted, just like what Donnie said, I'll, I'll, I'll give 200%. If I'm not trusted, you wouldn't believe that my musicianship actually goes below zero. 
Whereas you take an average studio musician, they're going to be white toast and they'll be at 60 all the time. Someone could be a prick or a nice guy or a good guy. They'll stay in that range. Me, if I have a Bowie, I will give everything in my heart. And if I have an asshole director, which I've had, and they're micromanaging every note, they fucking take the life out of me and I want to fucking kill them. You know, that's why I'm quarantined. Like, you know, so, so, you know, there you go. You know, when he trusted me and I gave him my best, you know, and we all did. You know, well, I think that speaks to, um, speaks to the leadership, you know, and, and, and when I think about like Miles Davis um, and, and David, you know, it's that same idea where you get these people and then you trust them and you turn them loose and you want them to do what they do and you don't want to inhibit that, you know, and, and, and uh, I don't know, I think that's really inspiring and, 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 and I, yeah, it's something I think I, you know, when, I, when I'm in the role as, of a leader, you know, I don't want to micromanage people. I don't want to tell them what to do. I want them to bring their unique voice to the music and see what they do, because I often learn from that. And, well, um, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, Tim. <laughs> Tim. I see Tim laughing. A little less Tim LaFave, a little more Paige. Right, Don? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. You know, we have this running joke, like, like Tim just is just could not be more creative, you know, and 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 then you know sometimes when we really stretch or whatever, and it'll get really out, and that's like kind of like yeah, Tim. I'll start. Sounds good. Um, couple. <laughs> Tim Lafave, a little more page. Oh. <laughs> Joke, because it's just you know. Personalities. And that's you know. Yeah, when we do the live, the you know the when we did the thing in New York in uh, January, I, I was playing all Carmine's bass lines. It's so fun, man. You sound so great on those records, man. Thank really, you, thank yeah. you, thank you. Yeah, yeah. It was just one or two takes. I mean, he, he would he would go out, he would just pick whatever it was, and you would feel kind of well. I'm not doing yet because originally the last dance ended up being like a like a gap band kind of a groove, which is how Omar and I heard it because the original yeah. was pretty pretty simple. I just I just added the other notes to it, so it have a so it have some sort of cycle around it. And at that time, we went to the Gap Band, and we just wanted a big old stump, you know. Yep. <laughs> you know? And he was open for it, which is of kind was. of shocking to us. It was like very like, okay, I guess we're go we're in, you know, we're going in, you know. And and even if you, with the mistakes or odd notes or whatever, he would find a place for them. You know, he would just, whatever it is, he'll find a place for those notes that will make musical sense to him, which which is, again, with the trust, which is very, very important. I mean, it was just really just easy to work with him. Just, you know, because, like, again, he's a great casting director. And I don't know if you guys, maybe Mike, maybe Mike or Mike Potty, is, um, he had to switch instruments. If it sounded too, too, too exact, he had to switch instruments that we, that we weren't mm -hmm. aware of playing. Thank God I didn't have to play a horn. But, you know, he would switch me the drums and switch somebody out to something else. And with all that kind of fucked upness, he finds shit in it. You know, us, us yeah. you know, being us un uninhibited. And, and he would piece something together like we did on Dance with the Big Boys and stuff like that. On the second album, Loving the Alien album. We did a bunch of stuff like that. And he would just switch instruments. And he says, yeah, you really fucking that up real good. I said, but I like it. I said, oh, OK. Yeah. I said, you know, that was that was fantastic to be to have that kind of trust again, to be allowed to go, you know, you just just, you know, I know you can't play that instrument, but you'll come up with something that I'll that I will use later on. And he did, especially mm -hmm. on that track, my dad with the big boys and uh, a couple other ones. Yeah, I, I always found it hard to believe that he never, ever said anything to me like, don't do that, please. Or he just let you do what you do. And he trusted you. <laughs> I found that. Yeah. You would make a mistake. Right. What you thought was a mistake, and he would go, wait. Or, you know, I'd be sequencing stuff and I'd have a weird loop going just to and go, ooh. And he would he would dial into this thing. And you'd go, you would think, that's never gonna work. Never and then work. he'd take that. And then you'd start listening to it and go, Oh, that's interesting. Right. And then another couple of minutes will go by and go, what the fuck is this? <laughs> where did that come from? You go, where exactly. did that come from? 
And how did he dial into that from some stupid mistake I made? And he fashioned it into something else. Yeah. And I never. I, I, I think he was aware that the notes find you as much as you find the notes. And they found him, and, and, and we found him, and they f found us. So he had a bigger viewpoint than the individual small self. He just saw it as a big self, and wherever it came from. And, and it's a very actually spiritual viewpoint on, on music. He just didn't talk about it in those terms, but we all felt it, you know? Well, he was big picture. That He was always like, he had the idea, and, and he just let us do what we do. Right. And he would steer us a little, you know, yeah, yeah. like this. Exactly. He'd pull a little, mis like I said, pull, but but he kind of was really almost subliminally driving that bus. Do you remember when we did? Up. Do you remember when we did the letter or battle for Britain in in, yeah. in Philip's studio? And and it, before I played the solo on Battle for Britain, he sent me down to Tower Records to listen. He said, listen to, you remember the Stravinsky Octet? He said, I think yeah. I learned it in college. He said, go get that record, listen to it, and create a piano solo with that vibe or that intention. I went down, I bought the seed, bought, it was vinyl, I bought it, played it, and then I made the Battle for Britain solo, which somehow you got the MIDI data. Didn't you guys do something funny and place my music in the studio? Share that. I think you did it like maybe two or three goes and I just took the MIDI and we just sort of, you know, went through and then took bit by bit. I mean, I think it was, well, it's so long ago, but you know, generally things like that is maybe it's probably the beginning of one and the end of another, or just the middle part of something that it was, um, you know, you couldn't really manipulate. You didn't want to manipulate data like that too much. It was just sort of trying to say, this is the best part of this. This is the best part of that. And, but didn't you didn't you guys play a joke on me and take some of my notes and paste them on the studio wall when I came in one day some like a Von God stuff which unreadable I think so I think we, we took all of those solos and we made a score out of it that's right it was like three different takes of, of random piano and it was like that's what you play <laughs> uh, that was great I remember seeing that I walked in the room it was like unreadable it was like Stockhausen on st steroids or something yeah, yeah. There's like no white on that paper. It's all notes. It's the space. I'm the only one who doesn't believe in the space between the notes, right? More is less for Mike Orson. <laughs> You're getting better, Mike. Mike, thank you, better. sweetheart. Thank you, sweetheart. That's why I'm in quarantine. I just sit here playing whole notes. <laughs> well, when when we were recording Heathen up up at Alaire um, at the weekend of uh, Labor Day weekend, I I was up there on my own, and we were talking and. And he's trying to get some ideas about, you know, sort of avant-garde string sounds. And and I mentioned the George Crumb Black Angels uh, recording of the, the Kronos Quartet. And so I said, I'll send it to you, you know, FedEx, so you can have a listen to it. And, you know, we can um, address that when we come back next week. And so I did. I FedExed it to him. And when, when I came back a few days later, he said... It was really funny because when they uh, delivered the, the FedEx package to him, they were a little bit afraid because it said Black Angels on the label. <laughs> like voodoo or something, I don't know. Anyway. You know, I wanted to clear something interesting up for the record. Did you guys know uh, this very good jazz pianist, avant-garde pianist, he died a few weeks ago named Tibbet or something of that nature? His name was Tibbet. He played on 1970 on a King Crimson album. Anyway, he was very good, and he played like kind of an avant-garde solo. This is three years before I did Aladdin Sane. So in, in some review or article about him a, a week or so after he passed, it said he influenced Mike Arson on Aladdin Sane. But first of all, I was older than him. Secondly, I had never heard him till the other day. And, he, and I listened to that track from 1970 with King Crimson. He was very, very good. And it did sound a little like the way I played on Aladdin saying a little different, you know. But music is in the air at any given period of time. This 10-year thing, it sounds like the Beatles, and then it sounds like Bowie, and then it sounds like Cecil Taylor, and it sounds like Bill Evans. So, you know, it was just in the air. We probably heard similar things. But I, I felt bad because it, it, I, if he was the one who influenced me on this song, I would have said it, but I had never heard his playing. 
But Cecil Taylor, I could say, influenced me because I used to see him live and I took some of that. But the one who really influenced me was David and I played that solo through his mind. If he could play like me, what would he play? Because it wasn't exactly how I was playing. I was playing like McCoy Tyner or Winton Kelly or things of that nature at that time. And, and, and no, he wanted this avant garde solo because I had studied so much of that classical music and, and Cecil, it was easy for me to do. But it, I wouldn't have done that if, if it wasn't David. And he liked that music. The first conversation we ever had in 72 was about Charlie Mingus, you know. So he, he got it, and we talked about saxophones and jazz playing and, and all the other people who play more on the outside and you guys in the Black Star album, it's, it's kind of like, and Maria, he, he heard that, you know. In some ways, the way I played on that album, it poisoned him or it was a double-edged sword because he always was searching for people who do things on the outside of things, and that's why consequently we did do the outside album, you know. It's just he liked wrong notes because there's no such thing, right? <laughs> That's what it is. Yeah, when he when he hired, am I unmuted? Yeah, David Torn is a perfect example. You know, yeah. it, it's a genius move for him to. I, I'm a huge Torn fan, and like just to have him on records, like doing his thing, is um, that was it's a beautiful thing, right? Yeah. Yeah. I, like there's a solo he takes on um, uh, the next day, on the next day that track. Like he takes a solo at the end. It's a kind of whammy bar and wah pedal. It's so out and so perfect. It's just like, it's like favorite recorded guitar solos on, on a Bowie record. It's insane how good, you know, just like. It just did, he of, ever, did he ever have a bad guitar play? I mean, really, it's amazing, right? Yeah. And did you know that Platty, we have actually three bass players on Zoom today because Platty actually was originally a bass player, right? Yeah. And used to jump on bass and Gail would jump over the guitar, right? Yeah, that was just kind of a little goof that happened. What was uh, that song we did it on, Ashes? Ashes. Yeah, well, we were doing all those mimer things, you know. I, we were doing all those promo gigs, and we weren't really playing while well, he was singing. And Speaking of playing was, a lot of notes, speaking of playing a lot of notes, Platter, you're a pretty busy bass player. I had my moments. <laughs> so we the had to switch for a song to make it interesting, you know, and then it just kind of stuck. Yeah. I call it justification, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, you played great. It was great. I love those Thanks. moments. Well, it's so wonderful. Martha, any more questions we didn't answer? We told everything we know. Um, I think that was the, the gist of it. Um, a lot of people watching. Uh, oh, Keith Tippett was the name of the Keith Tippett. Oh, right. That's right. Yeah. 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 I mean, I, I, I loved hearing him the other day on this King Crimson album. I think it was something, Cat Food or something. It's the second crazy. album. It's crazy. Yeah. Album. Cat Food yeah. was on the second album. Yeah, yeah, yeah. With Greg Lake, uh, vocals, yeah, and Ian McDonald on, key, on second keyboard. Who, who was singing? Uh, Greg Lake. Was it? And that song, Cat Food, yeah. He sang. Oh, he sang it sounds great. It sounds great. And, and they have this panning going on on the mix. And it's great. you got to listen yeah. to it. I was, 1970 is like 50 years ago. I was just in heaven listening to it, you know. But I didn't know the guy. I, I, I'm sorry I didn't know the guy. He, I think he was an English jazz pianist, you know. Yeah, because they had, they had two keyboard players. They had Tim and then, uh, him and uh, Ian McDonald. It's the second right. keyboard player. Right, right, right. right. Time. And Greg Lake. Yeah, that was, a great, that was the second album. Great album. Cat wow. Food. Great track. <laughs> yeah. What There's else, Arthur? A few more questions coming in, but uh, well, any particular recording you're proud of being on? I, I know for Donnie and Tim, that's kind of an easy one, and for me too. But, you guys uh, did a great job on that too, really. Great Thanks. job. You guys did a wonderful job on it. You did awesome. a great job on Heathen Martha. You know, yeah. for me, it's like Outside, Aladdin yeah. Saint, Diamond Dogs, Young Americans, yeah. you know, Pinups was great. There's a solo I played that I hadn't heard for 30 years, 40 years. It was C. Emily Play. It was written by wow. that that guy, you know, <laughs> the crazy guy. Sid Darrett. Sid <laughs> from Pink Floyd. From, from Sid, yeah. But yeah. I, I, I took a solo on that. I didn't realize I played like an outside solo on that. And good old Mick Ronson, you know, scored it with strings and everything. It was great, you know. Did you know that Mick Ronson took some scoring lessons from Tony Visconti on, on, on for orchestration? 
He taught him. Tony's yeah. a master. And they were both both great orchestrators. And uh, Mick Ronson was actually even simpler. And and those arrangements on Life on Mars and all those they're, they're amazing. They're just so simple, but they're so right, you know. Right. Yeah. You know when he comes in. <laughs> The cellos on the fifth of the quarter. It was just great, you know. You know, to this day. To this day. To this day. To this yeah. day. Yeah. Well, I think we said all we know. I have to record some music the rest of the day. I'm yeah, really this, is, this has been really great. Thank you all so much for you know being here. It was great to you know be in the same Zoom room with you all, and uh, <laughs> hopefully we'll, we can all be together in a in a real concert venue at some point in the near future. So. Uh, I'm hoping, like I said, on January 8th, I have some stuff in mind. I can't tell you all now, but you all hear from me. Excellent. Look and I know you have no other gigs, so this is the only time I'll get you. <laughs> uh, yeah. Every time I go, Donnie, the last three is always working, you know. Not I can't believe we never worked together in the jazz world. I mean, where were you when I was playing with Brecker and Steve Grossman and Liebman? You probably weren't born, right? <laughs> probably a little bit before my time you know but, <laughs> but uh, I hope and, tim, and tim i never worked with you you play upright and electric i mean i love your bass playing thank you tim and i actually we we met many years ago at the american composers orchestra we were both soloists that's right uh ed um i remember that guy yeah and we did it to a click track right and it was like a video screen yeah oh, i first met you that's because you were playing violin with effects and doing taking it yeah yeah. Well, Martha, you sat in with us last year, didn't you, on Aladdin? I did, yeah, that was fun. And we used to do amazing, crazy stuff when we did the Duke Ellington music yeah, that Ellington at the band. Kennedy Center when I, I had, was commissioned to write classical and jazz and I had the string section doing jazz and the brass quintet doing the classical parts. And yeah, oh yeah, you pushed us to the limits for, for sure. I, I, I apologize. <laughs> yeah. Hey, Mike, Mike, make sure... We're all going to be there in January, all of us. We're all going to be what? Make sure January that we're all going to be there. Work hard on it. Everyone, everyone. <laughs> I'm going to have a song. Masks on. Yeah. Well, I, have, I have one arrangement with eight bass players already. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're, we're ready. Tim and I are ready. And Mike. Uh, uh, it's Excellent. Great. Oh, it's going to be great. All right. well, thank you all for being here. Thank you for arranging this, Martha. And, and, and even Tide, thank them and tell them I'm using their plugins, making crazier music. And I will have to play yes. this one note and I sound good so I could save all that energy. I can't wait to hear it. You don't want to hear it. It's really horrible. But it's yeah. at least it's it's not like when Mark works with plugins. You know, I, I'm, they sent me the, the rose you know, little box, so I have that little thing. In oh, the, the rose pedal. Yeah. And, and connecting it to the piano. Plotty would love it, you know, it's just that it's ridiculously obnoxious sounding, but I love it, you know. Yeah, try some of the shimmer algorithms. Shimmer uh, algorithm. I will. I, I, it, it's guitar envy, let's face it, you know. Get your hands on an H9, too, if you can. I, I, I got it. I got it. I, I, oh. <laughs> I put my voice on it last night because I can't sing and I'm doing a, a charity project. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so I, 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 I'm doing the thing with We Are the World for um, children with autism this week. So I've been working on that. And I wrote a little melody at the end. So I had like four of my voices and I used the black hole and the shimmer and, and, and the <laughs> and I, I mean, it's really horrible, but but it's hilarious. You know? <laughs> Till the next time, right? And next on time. that note, everybody... Thank you. Yeah, Johnny. Well, thanks to all the people who came in. I, I don't, you don't know who's there, but you could feel them. But, you know, if there was nobody there just to hear your stories, it, it just warms my heart, you know. And I, you wish you were at each of those places, you know. It's hard to explain it. You just wish you, you were there for each person's story. There's not one person that was, except David, that was there for it all, you know. Six degrees of David Bowie. David and Coco. <laughs> and Coco. And Coco. And Coco. Excellent. All right. Well, it came from by Menon. By Menon. It was <laughs> stick deodorant. <laughs> All right. And on that on that non-Bowie note, play a Bowie note. Good night, folks. Okay. Good night. Bye-bye.